Yes, we're very aware of Bobby's underlying condition and the inexorable progression that was unavoidably going to unfold. Uh, he had been admitted to the hospital with another crisis of whether he was going to go into frank respiratory failure. And the team had the neurology team who was following him as well as the critical care team um, more acutely involved in his care had talked to the parents about where Bobby was clinically, the signs of potentially impending respiratory failure, um, despite at this point, maximal efforts with non-invasive ventilation and other therapies. The parents did not want to go ahead with intubating him, realizing that that was almost certainly going to be a irreversible level of support once engaged that he was going to either require going on for mechanical ventilation support with most likely a tracheostomy or that they were going to have to think about a compassionate extubation at some point. But they couldn't make up their mind. And I was asked early days of doing the ethics consult service to come by and talk to Bobby's parents. It was late in the day, I believe it was in you know, the darker days of, of winter. Um, it was darker outside. I remember the parents were sitting by the window in our intensive care unit that sorted the windows that frame one side of the room. And I sat next to them, uh, effectively between them and Bobby, who was on my right side laying in bed and introduced myself and, and basically explained that I was there to see if I could be of any help to them as they were sitting with a decision that they felt was both incredibly important and something that they could not wrap their minds around. And long story short, after talking to them for a while, again, it was very clear that they understood everything that was going on. There was no need for more medical details to be provided. But the, the words that they used sort of stuck in my ear. And at one point, I said to them, after they had said that they, they just couldn't let him die, that that was not something that they could ever see themselves being able to live with. Um, I, I stopped the conversation and, and said, do you mind if I ask you a question? There's something you just said that I want to go back to. And my question is, who's in control of what's going on with Bobby right now? And the parents looked at each other and they said, well, I mean, you know, the medical team's taking care of him. Uh, understood, understood totally. But who's in control of ultimately what is happening to Bobby? And the parents again looked at each other and one of them said, well, we, we know the disease is really in control. Um, and it's, we hate it. It's going to ultimately, and then they just sort of trail off, not even completing the sentence. It's ultimately going to cause him to die. And I said, well, I agree with you that the disease is in control. Why then are you saying things like whether you're going to let him, and I'm just going to say this out loud, let him die. Um, if you had it in your power, you would never let him die. It's clear how much you love him, that you would sacrifice everything for him. The disease is causing him to die. Maybe the better question for us to focus on is how we're going to let him live before that happens. And the parents again sort of looked at each other and it seemed that something inside them recognized what I had just said. They, they said, you know, that's right. Uh, we're not in control. 
long story short, there was more to the conversation. And they ultimately decided that instead of proceeding with intubation, that they were going to put in a do not intubate order in addition to what already they had placed in regard to cardiac resuscitation. So a, a more complete DNR order was entered and that they were going to expedite and they they asked that the team do everything that they could with non inhalation to keep him stable as much as they could through the night so that the um, that Bobby's grandparents who were coming up from the south would be able to arrive in time. Uh, the next day, grandparents having come and visited, again, about 24 hours after I, I met them, uh, they, in a very compassionate, loving gesture, uh, had the non-invasive technology removed and Bobby passed uh, and died peacefully. I've devoted a large part of my clinical career doing both palliative care and ethics, uh, as well as a, as an investigator, trying to understand what are those moments uh, where there is a recognition, an epiphany of sorts, um, that there is a at least a, an other path available to take care of children who are confronting what almost certainly is going to be a life-ending episode of illness. Not always, but most often. And thinking about how those types of conversions or epiphanies or recognitions and pivoting um, how to understand it in a way that it's not just mysterious and uh, people may think that somebody used magic words or things like that. Uh, no, don't embellish this with mystery. Instead, try to understand the mechanisms, the techniques of communication, the techniques of decision support, and think about it more mechanistically. Now, as I talk to you, I should have started out by introducing myself and, and telling you that as a doctor, as a clinician, as the ethicist, um, I still do healthcare ethics consultation, uh, and as a division chief, helping lots of my faculty and staff think about their careers and what's possible and how they could be supported, that I'm going to be straightforward and tell you what I'm thinking. I promise that I'm going to tell you what I'm worried about, how much I am worried, and I'm not going to uh, at least try very hard. I'm going to try very hard not to make a promise that I can't be sure to keep. Um, I'll come back to this in a little bit, but it's this um, degree of candor that I just want to put out that that is my side of the bargain. Um, in order to enhance learning, uh, this may be a little bit uh, nettlesome, but I'm going to have some questions, uh, quiz questions throughout. Uh, when trying to collaborate with parents to make complicated decisions for their children, I often, and think about this for yourself, as either the clinician or the ethicist, I often feel unsure as to how the parents will receive my efforts. Are they going to get angry with me? Are they going to be upset? Uh, uncertain as to whether I know enough to guide them. Uh, the future is always uncertain. There's so much on this decision. Um, I'm concerned about what other doctors, if they were to walk in the room, would think about the decision that I'm guiding or at least enabling, facilitating the parents to make. Or is it all of the above? Um, there are subtle clues in all of these pop quizzes uh, about what I tend to think is the right answer. Um, we found when we talked with quite a few pediatric oncologists about the challenges that they were facing in trying to talk about really advanced cancer, potentially at end stage, end of life, very end of life, or beyond the point where cure was 
practically um, even possible, that these were all things that they worried about. When they walk out of a encounter or they're, they're thinking about a case, they often would say, well, there's so much uncertainty here. And the point here that I want to emphasize is that uncertainty usually was not about prognosis of the patient. They had committed in other comments that they had made that uh, they really believed that the prognosis was a short life span left before death occurred. Their uncertainty took on other forms about how the family is going to react, uh, personal doubt about expertise, a kind of imposter syndrome, and concerns about how other members of the oncology clinical team would view their decisions. I say all this because recognizing the context in which we are providing decision support, and even as an ethicist, if you go in there, the same things may be uh, filtering through your mind of how this is all going to go down. All of this needs to be recognized in order for it to be managed so that these factors are not unduly dominating the kind of decision support that we are providing. Much of decision support in the ethics literature has been wrapped up in this concept of shared decision making. Uh, Alex Kahn provided a useful, but as I'm about to say, overly simplistic model of uh, essentially a graded two ends of a spectrum. Patients make the decision completely autonomously. The doctor makes the decision completely autonomously. And somewhere in between, depending on where the, the fulcrum of decision making is located, one or the other is given more weight. Um, this is actually a widespread mental model. I think Alex captured it very accurately. Uh, and some of the instruments that actually measure decision making preference actually follow this to a T. Um, but let's look a little bit closer because I think that there are some interesting dynamics that this is missing. Um, if it's about a balancing point, it's not really clear when both are equal partners, whether that just simply means they have equal weight in all areas of decision, or is there an equal division of labor? The patient is responsible for bringing their values and their preferences, and the doctor is responsible for bringing the medical facts, and they're going to have to figure that out. Um, and neither one dominates, but they're actually doing quite different things. There's also the problem of it can really result in the concept that you're trying to share something and there's a control here. Um, admittedly, though, uh, in the American context for the vast majority of discretionary medical care, the decision is completely owned by uh, the adult patient. And in the pediatric setting, there's a lot of discretion as to what parents are allowed to do or not do on behalf of their child. So. The tug of war may actually, on the one hand, not accurately represent the true balance of power, although the clinical team has a lot of power. I don't want to underemphasize that. Uh, but what it's really not addressing explicitly is the conflict that may be causing this tug of war to occur in the first place. There are other problems. Um, Sarah Eaton, a now a pediatric resident up at Yale when she was down at University of Miami, conducted a national study of pediatric shared decision making for simple and complex decisions uh, as a Delphi process that included a panel of 21, a typical size for Delphi project, uh, clinicians, researchers, parents. Uh, they were involved in primary and in specialty care. There were multiple rounds as you should do in Adelphi, independent ratings, and the ratings were on the standard Delphi one to nine score from strongly disagree a one to strongly agree a nine. Um, I'm not going to go through this in any detail, and uh, thank God this is so small you can't read it, so you don't even try. Uh, the point is that all of these are fundamental processes and sub-processes, all the things that people talked about that needs to occur at some point for a shared decision-making process to potentially occur. 
So it's a long list. And then the goal, once you had this long list, was for people to go through and rate them. So the discovery part of the project was what is this long list? Um, that long list was then rated, and I'm going to show a couple of these graphs. Uh, a nine is people strongly agreed with it. The dot means that that was the median score that at least half the people or more actually gave it a nine if there's a little orangish dot on the nine. If the orangish dot is on the eight or on the seven, that's where the median was. The little green bar means that 75% of all the respondents, so 21, just for simplicity's sake, I'm going to say 15 of the 21 respondents had to be within that zone. So the majority of people in some of these cases where there's just the orange dot and no little green bar, everybody basically said that this is extremely important. Now, let's look at how there is lack of agreement about some of these characteristics. Um, it is not uniformly agreed upon that determining ethically appropriate treatment options up front, sort of setting the boundaries, is a task that needs to or should be performed. Uh, assessing the information preferences of the family was not uniformly agreed upon. In other words, do I go in and talk to, say, Bobby's parents and say different families like to make decisions differently? Do you prefer that I offer a recommendation? Do you want me to just provide informational counseling? That was not viewed as a, um, a agreed upon necessary aspect. Discussing treatment option benefits and burdens with the family, which really, um, again, I found this to be pretty surprising. One would think that this is an essential part of shared decision making, talking about the uh, pros and cons of the treatment options that were under discussion was not uniformly agreed upon. Providing a treatment recommendation was not uniformly agreed upon. In other words, there are some people who have very strong feelings that it's part of the duty of clinicians, physicians to offer a treatment recommendation. You have option A, B, and C, I recommend for you based on, and then you could explain the rationale, but I recommend for you that you choose option B. Um, that was not uniformly agreed upon. Some people think that that's too, um, that's not sharing enough that you should in fact let the uh, family or the patient pick amongst A, B, and C. Now, when I say they're not uniformly agreeing, they're still agreeing, an eight is not a two, but they're not adamant about it. Um, if you look, uh, this is a little bit um, broader. These are where you didn't even have as much tight uh, amount of agreement. Now the orange bar is showing that half of the people, so 10 um, out of the, the 21, uh, or the range, which is the gray bar, a little bit harder to see, you can see that for some of the uh, items under determining clinician directiveness, should I be talking about how much uncertainty is there is and the severity of consequences and moral uncertainty, you had panelists that were literally across voting some at one, some at nine. Um, so there's a lot of internal lack of shared mental model about the degree to which the clinician should be directive in shared decision making uh, for shared decision making. Uh, and again, here's assessing the family uh, preferences of whether the family wants to have a recommendation. Do you want me to make a recommendation? Again, some people are in the upper end of the scoring range and some people, if they're five or below, they're voting effectively against it. So, thank God for shared decision-making. We all have consensus. It's a standardized stepwise process. It's a panacea for preventing conflict. It is a solid prevention against bias. Or is it, despite our desire for it to be more than what it is, a fuzzy ideal that provides guidance but can create confusion and particularly variance in practice because of no standard sense of what should and should not be done in this uh, so-called practice of shared decision-making.
And I fear that the answer to this is more D than we care to admit. So if these complementary mental models of, you know, a gradation, some kind of balancing point, or just an outright tug of war are sort of still potentially a play, even in a panel of experts, where do we go? Well, one place to go is to actually drop the question entirely. Uh, we'll come back to it uh, and think instead, what are parents asking themselves? Now, I'm going to make a couple of points when I am posing this. I'm thinking about what were Bobby's parents thinking as before I entered the room, as we sat there and talked, even uh, as they were trying to make the decision. Uh, and I'm just going to throw out the idea that they were asking, what should I do? Notice this is not what is the best medical decision or what decision optimizes the best interests of Bobby. Um, those may be relevant questions to also answer to come to the more fundamental question of what as a surrogate should I do? That's why when we focus on providing more medical details about pros and cons, um, we may be skirting around, we may be informing up to a point, uh, but not getting to the heart of one of the questions that the parent may be thinking about the most intently. Um, maybe not articulating it this way because we culturate them um, in all of the rounding and talking about decisions every day about the pros and cons of each little tweak on the ventilator. Um, it's sort of externalizing the problem. Um, it is Bobby, so that's not within the parent, but um, the more fundamental place where I'm positing that many parents do their most difficult work is this question. Uh, I will also pause and say, I think it's also where many clinicians do some of their more difficult work. Um, if they can think through a case and figure out here's the pros and cons and what is left though is ultimately what should I be doing in this sake, in this circumstance? And I think this is the source of when that question is not addressed adequately, uh, moral distress and other feelings of self-doubt. The question then becomes, if, if that concept is correct, that parents are quietly thinking, what should I do uh, as a parent? Is that a personal question that really clinicians should not get involved in? And, uh, what is the ethics of us potentially getting into that more identity area for parents and, and their own moral constructs of actually how they view their parental duty? Um, I'm just going to bookmark that. I'm not too particularly bothered by this, but I do think it is a boundary issue that needs to then because once you go into this space, you have entered into, if the parents consent for you to do work with them in that space, it is a new type of relationship and you need to, or at least I feel I need to honor that permission that they've granted for me to do that work. And there's issues of trustworthiness and confidentiality and, and sort of um, protecting the uh, parent who has opened themselves up for potentially talking about this type of an issue and seeking guidance. We've written about this. Um, here is a uh, paper that we published on parental personal sense of duty as the foundation for pediatric decision making. One of the mental models that we walk around with, I think on the clinical side, is that uh, Bobby had a problem. There's no doubt about that. He, uh, I don't mean to make light of it, but it's just sort of he was clearly had impending respiratory failure. And the clinician in me has been trained to think, okay, what could I do in regard to that? I can titrate the BiPAP. I could try to use some other medications to help uh, with lung compliance or perfusion, et cetera. Uh, or I could go on to intubate. 
the problem of that model is that it presumes that the problem is the problem is the problem. When in fact, Bobby had several problems, one of which was impending respiratory failure. One problem was how to live with that respiratory failure. It's highly related to what I just talked about, but it's a slightly different formulation of the problem. And how to maintain his comfort is different than how to maintain his respiratory status. The many to many model is more accurate about how a situation is often being perceived by the multitude of people who are involved. And multitude can just mean two people here the parent and the clinician. And the problem that we often have is as doctors, we go in and assuming the problem that I think is the number one problem is the number one problem. And I'm not even going to talk about any other problem because I, I'm on a train and I got to get going and we have uh, uh, urgency here. Whereas the parent may not believe that the problem the doctor has identified is the most salient problem for them. They may be worried about a different problem. And by usurping the prerogative defining what the problem is, we actually become part of the problem because now the doctors are not actually listening to me. It may be that it's a dialogue of you know, proverbial two ships passing the night because we are looking at different problems. I have many examples where eliciting from the parents what are the main problems that you're struggling with? What are the main things that are bothering you? Uh, generates a list of issues, some of which are identified and being attended to by the medical team and other things that were simply not on the medical team's radar can emerge and be very influential on why the parents are making the type of decision or not making the decision uh, that really can help with subsequent dialogue and progress of care. Even more accurately, though, um, is that the nice little sketch on the left side is over precise, overly precise, that uh, there is a problem solving activity where parents have a situation. Here we are, we're in the hospital, Bobby has impending respiratory failure. He looks very uncomfortable. Oh my God, it looks like this may be it. Maybe he's going to die. Uh, I don't know what to do. Grandma and grandpa are down in Florida. Oh my God, what are we going to do? We have different goals and how do we make progress? How do we get out of this situation? What are the rules of the road? Um, this kind of more potentially overwhelming, bewildering set of circumstances um, probably is better captured by actually thinking not as an aerial view, even as captured in this photograph, but more the sensation one has when you enter a maze, get lost in the middle of it, and you can't see over the top of the problem solving challenges are not as linear, as logical, as uh, refined as people might want to believe in ethics, but instead they definitely involve emotion. They involve a lot of issues around trust and also personal circum, you know, circum, uh, introspection about how am I going to try to move through this maze. We talk a little bit in the paper about a more complex decision support model where people on the bottom are one, trying to make sense of what is the situation we're in. And then there's an active process of structuring the problem, of identifying potentially different problems and how they're related and which ones are more important. Uh, there is ultimately trying to think about options to generate them and think of what are the pros and cons and then ultimately making a decision and enacting it. I, can't emphasize enough that decision making is uh, a step in the process of actually making a behavior that implements the decision. Uh, sometimes the decisions are one time discrete, like a compassionate extubation. Although even that I've seen people attempt to reverse it even after it's been implemented. Um, 
for the time period where that's even technically feasible. Uh, but many decisions actually require repeated enactment and overemphasizing we got to make a decision may underestimate the need to build a decision where there's a sense, uh, a felt sense of the rightness of the decision that it can then be enacted. And up above, we're trying to indicate that this is not always a linear process. It can unfold, but it can also move backward. Uh, below, we're indicating this is an appraisal of what's the situation for the child, what's the situation for the person who's actually trying to think this through, we'll say the parent. Uh, and up above are these issues of how the parent actually thinks of their own personal sense of duty uh, to the child, potentially other responsibilities that they have for other members of the family or uh, outside of the family, as well as op operational rules um, and little things that they are doing like locus of control, thinking that they can control something that they haven't taken a step back and realized that the whole problem is that they're not in control uh, that may be affecting them. So in studying this, we have always done cohort studies where parents are in the midst of uh, still making decisions for their children, not necessarily an acute crisis. That would be um, ethically challenging to pull off uh, in an appropriate way. But we have had many cohort studies of children receiving um, with severe illness, um, receiving care, talk to us about how they make decisions. And it's quite clear as Picasso's painting of Guernica indicates that they are often bewildered by what is happening and they are overwhelmed by um, not only the information, but the suffering that they are witnessing. Um, it's not just the child's suffering though that is potentially causing them real distress. In a study that we did of uh, over 600 parents uh, basically receiving palliative care, we looked at their financial distress, uh, their, their own parental distress, financial distress, and the symptom burden of the child. And on the uh, left side, the uh, histogram shows the parental distress score, which is the Kessler 6 uh, standardized measure. And you can see that most of the parents, 69%, have moderate distress or above, and nearly one in six have severe distress. And that the total symptom score using a symptom assessment tool uh, ranges quite broadly, but is very high. Um, I would hope nobody in the audience would have a symptom score above two or three right now. And uh, these children often have very, very high symptom scores. The question then was, does the distress correspond entirely to how ill the child is, or does it also relate to financial difficulty, whether they're living with others, whether they are having difficulty with mortgage payments, utilities, or food? And you can see that while it was not a universal, thank goodness, uh, experience, quite a few uh, members of the sample actually had these material household hardships. Uh, and the answer, which I should go back to, uh, is that the it was about a 50-50 mix of whether the distress was related, uh, explainable by the child's symptoms versus these measures of uh, financial hardship. We've also looked at the impact that this has on the, uh, I often call it collateral impact on the parents and the siblings. Um, I won't get into details, but families that had either an extremely premature infant, uh, infant born with a congenital cardiac defect that required surgery, often those patients do quite well, but it's obviously a harrowing experience until the surgery has been performed that baby's healthy. Patients with oncologic problems or a very limited and progressive set of neurologic conditions, you can see that the mothers and the fathers were much more likely to receive prescription medications compared to essentially matched controls uh, with regard to uh, oncologic and neurologic conditions, uh, and to a degree also prematurity for the mothers. The siblings also, we see a similar type of pattern where the general pattern of estimates is all to the right um, of the vertical 
one bar, which indicates that the outcome is more likely for the brothers and sisters as well. So when I asked where are these decisions being made, it, the key point is it's not being made entirely in the left prefrontal cortex, that affect and stress and distress and other problems are clearly having an effect on how decisions are being made. And this is where we get into more of the collaborative mode. Uh, if this is the fundamental triangle of how we relate um, and make decisions by not just thinking our way to them, but also emoting and relating to other people around us, communication is the tool that allows that triangle of relationships uh, internally and across people to function more effectively and collaborative relationships enable that to happen. So making medical decisions involves thinking, feeling, relating, or as I hope I'm slowly convincing you, and I think we already knew this before this talk began, all of the above, we just are much better at explaining and focusing on the thinking part, but the feeling and relating bit needs more attention. So what happened with Bobby? Parents don't just think their way to the right decision, they also have to feel their way. And those feelings are not just about what's best for the child. I believe even walking into the room, they had already come to the conclusion that what would be best for Bobby is not to be intubated, but that they were stuck on concerns about what a loving parent would or should do. And that somewhere in the conversation that we had, there was uh, this epiphany that gave them access to understanding that a loving parent might focus on how Bobby would live and not try to control whether he was going to die, given that they were not fundamentally in control of that. In general, I think that these ideas can start to be put together in a mnemonic of sorts, um, I call it space for problem solving and decision making, where what we're trying to do in these conversations is to think about how we potentially use these four different aspects that affect how people make decisions. One of them is medical decision making, uh, medical information, and there's a tendency to just continue to provide more and more information. I call that the bulldozer strategy. We're going to convince Bobby's parents by telling them over and over and over again about why intubating Bobby would be a bad idea. I find that that is a way over relied upon strategy, and I usually ask people, please stop that for a while. We're going to work on these other areas. We're going to talk a little bit about what the family is hoping for, and they were clearly hoping that he could be as comfortable as possible. They wanted him to live as long as possible, but they were starting to realize, and this is the worry and the fears, that that time was drawing very, very short, and that was that pressure of having that feeling and not having anybody to talk about that with was pressing down on them and sort of limiting their space. Part of what I did was I did talk about, and I said, I'm sorry, I'm going to use some terms pretty clearly, you know, Bobby's death. Allow them to start naming what they were afraid of and how much they did not want that to happen as a kind of support so that it wasn't just pressing down on them alone as they were thinking about him potentially staying comfortable and how they wanted to let him live. And then the floor, the sense of parental duty was that they as loving parents might have to let go of the control over whether he was gonna live or die, recognizing they couldn't control that and focus instead on how he was gonna live before he died. I've mentioned the good parent beliefs a couple of times. Uh, Back in an earlier study, we had talked to 200 parents of 158 kids about what they themselves perceived to be their good parent sense of beliefs. You can read about it in JAMA Pediatrics. Here are the items that we had in focus groups and talking to parents identified that parents really felt that this is what I think I need to be doing to be the best parent for my child. I need to advocate for my child. I need to focus uh, my child having as long a life as possible, my child's comfort, my child's health, focusing on my child's quality of life, spiritual well-being. I need to keep a positive outlook. I need to keep a realistic outlook. 
I need to make informed medical decisions. I need to make sure my child feels loved. I need to put my child's needs above my own sort of sacrifice, and I need to stay at my child's side. Now, if we were together, I'd ask people in the audience to shout out which of these appeals the most to you, potentially as a parent. Invariably, there's a pause because nobody wants to do it too quickly. People start to nominate what would be their top choice. And different things come back. Somebody in the audience, oh, I, I definitely feel I need to advocate. I need to put my child's needs above my own. Child's comfort, that would be the most important thing to me. I need to make sure my child feels loved. And I say, those are all beautiful answers. But I would not know in talking to you as a parent, which of these items you would pick unless I ask the question, what do you feel you need to do to be on your own terms, doing the best job you can for your child? Turns out when we had done a more systematic way of canvassing all the parents, there's a broad range with making sure my child feels loved, tending to be at the highest ranking, although the bar's width shows you that some people gave it very little importance and other people gave it paramount importance. And all the way down at the bottom, you have spiritual well-being tending to be that's up to a higher power. Many people felt that they didn't need to be in charge of that. That was sort of already taken care of. But for some parents, that was the most important thing. The point is, I don't know that unless we broach the topic and parents won't spontaneously broach this topic. It can really open a doorway to having a very different conversation with a parent or two parents because they often will have slightly different complementary, as I often see it, uh, a sense of what they need to be focused on to really help them understand how they are internally working through what they should do. So when parents have a child with a serious illness and ask what they feel they need to do to be a good parent or do the best they can for their child in their own eyes, they all prioritize exactly the same thing. Yeah, this is a waste of time, we no need to ask. They each prioritize only one thing or they prioritize a set of things, often one or two, there may be something that's most important, but it's not like the only thing that's important. And it gives you an opportunity to explore what they are going through in their own evaluation. We've done similar things with goals of care with 680 um, parents of children receiving palliative care services and whether their goals and they rated all five of these uh, seeking quality of life, seeking health, seeking comfort, disease reduction, or a longer life. And again, while the overall rank ordering across this population suggests that quality of life is very important in general, and seeking a longer life is not nearly as prioritized, you do have people who are in both of those categories at the other end of the spectrum. Um, so ditto, every parent has the same goal? No need to ask. Mm -mm. They only have one goal? Mm -mm. They have a different set of goals, some of which are in tension with each other. I want Bobby to live as long as possibly, but I really, really want him to be comfortable. So that is intention and figuring out how to help parents work through that can be really helpful. The goals also changed over time. Here we are in uh, longitudinal analysis, looking at how the goals changed over increasing amounts of time that they were receiving palliative care services from not just study time, but even before the study had commenced. And you can see in general, quality of life continues to be the most likely highest prioritized, and that comfort actually does eclipse health, pursuing health. Pursuing health never is not on a parent's to-do list, even in a child who has a DNR, even in a child where palliative care goals are dominating, maintaining that child's health is always going to be something that most parents care about. Uh, but eventually, comfort even eclipses that. Um, so there is relative stability, but not constant and people within at the individual level are changing quite a bit. Uh, this is the percent that changed any goal. If you look over the course of the study and people who uh, change their top goal. So 40% of the parents, the next time we talk to them, their top goal had changed. So 
all goal discussions are time stamped. So it's the same goal repeatedly. Nope. A different goal. Nope. A different goal and not infrequently changed. That's the pattern that we are seeing. So let's end briefly with some practice recommendations. Um, I've given you a lot of conceptual models and some of the research that we've done to back them up. Uh, I have written a novel of 12 different cases that is uh, that are encountered by a pediatric intern to illustrate many of the concepts that we're talking about today in this book, uh, Light and Shadow, if you are interested for a more embodied sense of how this would play out. Um, I'm going to talk about partnering leadership, uh, and here are the six different areas that we're going to cover. First, an invitation. How can I be helpful? This is a way that I started off the conversation almost with Bobby's parents and most parents. Um, and note in particular this technique, is it okay if I ask a question? I call this conversational consent of allowing the conversation to take on a topic. It's almost like a warning shot. The next thing I'm going to ask you is going to be a little bit harder. Are you okay if I do this? Um, that is more than just a courtesy. It's a commitment to respect for persons and allows a trustworthiness to build. I also offer, as I did at the outset, uh, a sort of summary statement, concise, about how I'm promising to conduct myself. I'm going to be straightforward. If I'm worried, I'll let you know. I'm not going to make a promise if I can't keep it. That forms my side of the compact. I've done this for 15 plus years. Never had a parent tell me, no, 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 don't do that. Please beat around the bush, use euphemisms. Um, at least half of the time, I get a very enthusiastic response. This is how they want me to hold up my side of the bargain. And this then provides a context. I framed my behavior with my intention to be helpful to them by being straightforward, by telling them when I'm worried, by not overpromising, and it it conditions the way that they interpret our subsequent discussions. When I I said I promised I'd be straightforward, that I can be straightforward with in a compassionate way and not come off as being brusque or blunt. We talk about hopes and fears. Um, can you help me understand from your point of view what's going on? What are you hoping for? Or if that's an overwhelming question, flipping it around, what are you scared of? This does, if they are willing to start talking about this, establish a deeper level of relationship, which I would liken to almost establishing a covenant um, that I need to then live up to in terms of my respect for them and what they have shared with me. As I've spent the majority of this time uh, over the last couple of uh, slides talking about parental sense of duty is a very key part of what parents are, are working with and figuring out how to open up this door. I've talked to a lot of parents and I've learned that they often have inside themselves a felt sense of what they need to do to be the best mom, best dad that they could be. Um, I may need to prime the pump. You know, some parents, they feel like they have to advocate. They need to, to be here constantly with the child. They feel like they need to uh, put their child's needs above their own. Is there anything like that that really you feel you need to be doing? And once they get it, they will be able to often open up that door and talk about what it is for them. And then I can ask, how is that going for you? Is there anything we could do to support you? We've talked about how this space model and again, it's like the, the ceiling, the floor, the door, and the wind, uh, pardon me, the wall ahead of you, the wall behind you. This is a mnemonic I use in the mix of a discussion to think about where I might go next in the conversation. If I'm managing other people's emotions, helping them manage them, this issue of name it to tame it, of talking about how scared they are that. Bobby is going to die, how they feel so angry over the inability they have to control it. All of that allows them to both feel acknowledged and heard and felt, and then be able to figure out how that's going to factor into their decision-making process. At the same time, and this is the uncertainty of, of how are they going to perceive me, 
um, and just how difficult it is to walk into the room and feel the amount of pain that is often occurring, not just in the patient, but in the, the parents of being self reflective and being able to have techniques of calming myself to be able to engage and not be so preoccupied with my own response to uh, the suffering that's going on in the room that I'm not effective. We have done a number of things and written about how you can think about regoling. I've seen loving parents proceed with intubation. I've seen loving parents decide that the best thing to do is to not do that and instead to focus on comfort and we'll get the grandparents here tomorrow and then we would plan to actually give him medications to keep him comfortable and remove the non-invasive BiPAP. All of that allows you to re-goal and potentially work on things that they can control, like how he was going to live before he died. Final quiz then, how do emotions, love, hope, relationships help with medical decision-making and partnering and collaborating with families? more than we typically acknowledge. I mean, we know all of this stuff. I don't think I've told you anything that you didn't know already, but we tend to not analyze it, think about it, discuss it, so that we are on a learning curve to get better at it over time. Best practices for decision support, I believe, have to factor in parental love and a sense of duty and figure out how to dialogue across uh, the the boundary between us and the families with our own commitments and duties as we figure out how to create partnering relationships that will lead us forward. Uh, the slides will be handed out um, in PDF form, and here's a list of things if you want to read more about it. And with that, I am going to thank you for your time and attention today and stop my presentation and answer any questions that we have. Thank you, Dr. Futner, for a great talk. Um, Dave, uh, I believe we can stay on until 9.30 or so to take questions and have a discussion. Certainly, we have plenty of time for overflow for anyone who uh, has the time to attend. Okay. Well, uh, please feel free to ask your questions directly or put it in the chat. Okay, I'm reading a question now. In some cultures where the general practice is for physicians to drive the process, engaging shared decision-making may be perceived by surrogates or parents as doctors are not sure. How should we address such situations without being too paternalistic uh, and accounting for relevant values and perspectives? So I think that's a great question and, and goes back to that item that I said that people are um, not uniformly in agreement on. So, uh, Prasna, let's, I'll role play with you a little bit. You know, sir, um, uh, I would like to know, would you prefer, uh, I'm happy to give you a recommendation as to what I think would be best for your child. I know some families want that. Other families, they're like, no, thank you. I want you just to give me information. Um, which would you prefer? And I have gotten, I've, Ask that question, uh, particularly in situations where in the American context, people can get very reluctant to, to be directive. And I have been told by families, we want your recommendation. We, we want you even to make the decision. Uh, and everybody then you know, throws their hands up and they get all consternated. Um, but I think that that piece of information usually is not difficult to, to obtain that that's what they want. And then we need to retreat and figure out, okay, who amongst our team feels comfortable making the recommendation? Um, they want it, you know, the metaphor I use all the time, and it's a bit of a, a difference, but if I go to a car mechanic and my car is making this horrible noise and I said, I don't know anything about cars, can you look at my car? And the mechanic at the end of it says, uh, I've looked at your car and here's the problems. And I'm like, well, what should I do? Oh, I can't tell you that. I'd go get a different car mechanic. And I think the fact that we all probably would feel sort of the same way. I, I want to know what the bill is. I want some information, but I don't know. Is this a fixable problem or should I basically decide that 
uh, I need to face facts and that uh, the repair is not going to be worth it, what have you. Now, that does not mean that I can't, if I'm providing a recommendation, also explain why I'm making the recommendation. You know, again, Prasna, like we've talked at length about what your thoughts are about um, the care of your, your son, your daughter. And here's what I'm recommending for the, your child. And I'm doing this because you've told me that this matters greatly to your child, or this matters a lot to your family. Um, here's what I think uh, the likelihood that this will work is, and I'm, I can't promise it will work, but it looks like it might reasonably work, or I can't recommend that because I, as much as I wish it would work, I think the chances are it will not work. And I know that that matters to you. So I can do a audit essentially for the family about why I am making the recommendation I am. Uh, and then in that audit, they could say, whoa, 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 uh, you didn't hear us correctly. We actually care about this, not that. Um, I find that the audit uh, combined with the recommendation and the, uh, the rationale for making that recommendation, uh, I think is a way of shared decision-making that can account for the relevant values and the perspectives and you're sort of getting a member check directly from the people potentially of a different culture. Um, do I have this understanding correctly? So I hope that's a, a reasonable answer to that question. Uh, do you have any data on parental regret months after death? Uh, unfortunately, no. Um, we have attempted to do bereavement research of following up with families uh, after their child has died in a research context. And participatory rates are very, very low. So low that I don't even attempt to do it anymore because I don't think you can generalize from such a small percentage of the sample. Particularly given the likely effect that if people do not want to participate, it may be indicative of how they are actually doing in their bereavement. What we have more uh, anecdotal and a massive amount of anecdotal data is how parents are doing in their bereavement when they're being seen by our bereavement team members on our palliative care team. We do not hear a lot of decisional regret. We have extraordinary amounts of grief. And I'm not going to say regret doesn't ever occur, but it's usually not about decisions at the end, um, like what Bobby's parents decided. Uh, instead, there's often maybe regret about decisions that were made earlier or about uh, whether to have pursued a, a, a therapy that in, in fact did not work. Um, I don't want to overgeneralize that, but um, I think that we tell ourselves a story that parents are going to have to live with this decision forever, which is true, and that there is a right way and a wrong way to make that decision. There's a nature of the decision that will either tie them up in regret or worse grief than other ways. And I think that probably how parents handle their bereavement is uh predicted or predicated on how they handle many areas of their life uh, well before they got to this stage of um, having to make a decision about what to do uh, very close to the end of the child's life. I think, I, again, I'm not trying to make light of this. I wish we had much better data on it, but I would not be surprised that the parental regret is tied more with the same risk factors for um, complicated grief uh, and maybe not as much related to the actual decisions that were made around the time of the child's dying. Uh, th thank you for a great talk. Can I, um, can I ask you um, about something at the, toward the end of the talk about the that process of um, sort of ex exploring the sense of duty with parents. And I guess one of the things I'm, I, you know, uh, 
One of the things I'm wondering about is whether or not you think that that assumes that kind of when you kind of open that box that the parental sense of duty underneath is um, is is always going to be coherent or that it's not um, sometimes um, problematically gendered or problematically um, shaped by um, uh, by by different um, I don't know cultural views of of responsibility um, as a as a parent that that um, that you know that that might be that might be um, that might be fine and sort of within the the heterogeneity of 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 what we want to say is is good parenting and good sense of duty with regard to parenting and some that we might find problematic. Um, so so I guess I'm wondering if if you if you sort of thought about that and then. And then maybe this kind of might connect back to the the identity um, uh, point um, early on in the talk. That um, if if so, you know, do you think then that that the clinician, after opening up that box, might have responsibilities for helping the parent make their a sense of duty coherent, or to rebuild it if sort of opening up that box, if doing that exploration. Um, sort of causes distress in its own um its its own way. Yeah. Um so a couple of, of thoughts. You know, one I think we're all less coherent than we would like to believe about every big decision that we have to make in terms of the uh motives and the, the thought process. My main comment about that would be if it's if the um, engine that is driving and shaping our decision making is an incoherent mess we have an option of either ignoring that fact and letting it occur in a subterranean way um, and if people are making decisions and everything seems to be hunky dory you know I don't go down that path necessarily um, it's more when people are struggling and stuck and seeming to want some help confronting this huge decision and, and frankly even more than that just this the situation like i need help dealing with this um that this seems to be a effective box to open in terms of ultimately people may reveal something and then close the box like okay i'll, I'll tell you what i'm thinking is the main drivers that I have, the main sense of duty of a, you know, hands off, that's up to me and, and my, my partner to talk about. But I, I have to say, I've never had that response. Uh, I don't find that people find it distressing. They find it illuminating. Uh, they often find that, of course, I always feel terrible because I can't actually live up to all the duties that I feel like I should be living up to. Now, I'm gonna take us all on a little thought experiment. If you've lived this, it will potentially ring true. How many of us have had loved ones, parents or older members of our family or somebody we care about who's been sick where we were the surrogate decision maker? Or my mom and my dad. At no point in either of their journeys where they gave me complete, they wanted, they said, Chris, you make the decisions because we're overwhelmed, we can't make them. Uh, at no point did any doctor or clinician say, how's this going for you? It's a lot of weight on your shoulders. What do you think you need to do to be a good son for your dad? Uh, is there anything that's particularly eating at you? Bothering you that you're going to have to reconcile and think about whether you're going to have regrets later? Uh, I, I say that simply to draw attention to one, that this is a concept that I think is transferable into the adult realm for the surrogate decision maker who has tremendous weight put on them. And frankly, nobody is talking about the, the internal dilemmas they may have of, should I be acting according to what um, my dad told me or my mom told me? Should I be acting in their best interest, which might deviate from what they told me to do, what their preferences were? You know, how am I gonna reconcile that? Uh, and then all the other thoughts that might be going on. Um, if people engage, and this is not a, this is a metacognitive discussion. 
Um, it's a discussion of thinking about how we make decisions. So it's not everybody's cup of tea. Uh, but if they are willing to participate in it, I've never had somebody who seemed to walk away more distressed. I, they seem to feel more empowered because they now understand, ah, this is what's eating at me. And I've started to think about either one. I do care about both of these things and there is a tension and it's just, it helps me understand, or now that I've seen both of these, I can actually prioritize. Maybe I have a locus of control issue, which many people do of wanting to control something at the same time, knowing I can't, and I can de-emphasize that goal and instead move another sense of duty, focusing on his comfort as being more important. Duty and goals sort of relate to each other. Uh, but it allows you to think about how to actually make maybe the old ultimate set not more coherent, but more manageable in terms of how things are going to be uh, emphasized or de-emphasized. Um, you know, I haven't done a randomized control trial. I don't know whether, in fact, people do feel better or worse. Um, but this can occur not just at the end of life, it can occur many of the patients that take care of have chronic long term illness and there are many, many decisions that parents are having to make. And it does seem that it's like getting to read your own operating manual uh, of, you know, what are the ways that I actually am weighing decisions and not just by people telling me information about the procedure or my child, but also how do I algorithmically or whatever it is internally process? I'm reading my own operating manual so that I can actually do that work with a little bit more clarity, a little bit less bewilderment, and maybe a, a greater sense of 